So that's high praise, and I appreciate that. But we want to give God the glory. He is calling every one of us to finish the race. Amen. Too many people quitting. Got to stay with it. Got to finish it. And today we want to continue that thought in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, uh, verse 23. And be here tonight. We've got a special speaker, an apostolic sage, a teacher, a preacher, a man led by the Spirit. You're not going to want to miss that special speaker tonight. 1 Chronicles 4 and 23 reads this way. These were, I'm not going to read all the Old Testament names there. I'm just going to say, these were the potters and those that dwelt among plants and hedges. There they dwelt, where they live? With the king. Why? For his work. Simple thought today. The Lord wants finishers in his house. Finishers in the Lord's house. Finishers in the king's house. Finishers in the church building. Amen. Amen. Put your Bibles in and lift your hearts and minds towards heaven. Jesus today. God, we're just men and women, but we come alive by your spirit. Quicken us, God, and knowing our ears to hear. God, I know this word, I'm just a man, but your word is powerful. Let it find good ground and let it grow and be fruitful. Lord, to men, this looks like foolishness. But today we know it's the wisdom of heaven by preaching, by hearing, by applying the word of God, transformation, joy, peace, and love can come in our lives. We need it today. Help us to receive it. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Now get out of the row you're sitting on and find somebody you don't know and greet them in the name of Jesus today. And if you're going to help me preach today, you can be seated. Gloria, good to see you today in the house of the Lord. I must admit, I am still mad at Sister Katie today. She sold me 24 dozen, excuse me, 24 egg rolls, two dozen. I'm sorry, I almost said 24 dozen. Egg rolls, she made them yesterday when we went and picked them up. And I got to tell you, she shouldn't call them, take them home. She said they made it almost home. And my, I wasn't sure if my pants that I'd laid out for certain was going to buckle this morning. I, I'm still in pain. They're delicious. Thank you, Sister Kay. I'm so glad to be a part of a family that don't endure each other, but encourages each other. Amen. Y'all ever had family gatherings where you're just enduring? You know, you're looking at the clock. Won't know when it'd be too rude to leave, but maybe I'm the only one has family like that. Hallelujah. I want to talk today about potters in the king's house. I'm going to ask a question. Anybody here ever had a house built for you or have you built a house for yourself? Anybody built or had a house built? Okay. And and let me, let me just say, it is amazing that you can purchase a lot and the excavator can come and scrape it off really quickly and the footer goes in fast and the foundation is laid quickly and then the framer can come in and I mean in just a week to 10 days it can go from an empty lot and it looks like a house. 
there. And then another week to 10 days, the rough ends can happen like plumbing, electrical, insulation, mechanical. And then another 10 days, the drywall hanger can come in. And, you know, just within about three weeks, you've gone from a piece of dirt, my home, and you think, man, three, four weeks, we've got all this done. And this time next month, I'm moving in. And I got a statement for you. Ha, 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 ha. It starts fast, but it finishes slow. I'm going to preach in just a second. The house starts quick, but it finishes slow because you move into what's called the finished trades, sheetrock, painting, trim, carpenter, and things slow down because it's not just getting the job done. It can't just touch because that's the difference between a framing carpenter and a finished carpenter. A framing carpenter has the attitude, if it touches, nail it. There might be a gap, but no big deal. But when it's a finished carpenter, he'll measure it three times before he cuts. And then he might shim a little bit because he doesn't like the way it droops at one end. And then he might put a spacer or a notch in it. He may even cut a groove in the sheetrock to make it lay level. He gets a little broom and sweeps the little garbage on the floor out of the way. Whatever it takes, he wants to get it as, here's the word, tight as possible. Tight as possible. I don't have time to preach this. That's what I love about Ephesians. It's a house fitly framed together. Did, did you know in their custom that they built the temple? It didn't need no nails. But a trim carpenter is well-intentioned and as detailed as he is still has to uh, ask a favor of the painter that's going to come behind him. He said, can you put your best caulk man on this to just make it look even just a little? Now, let me tell you, painters get nervous when ca carpenters start caulking. Because <laughs> they're usually covering some stuff up. Today, I'm here to tell you, we've got a great carpenter at the house. Brother Gary Alford is just trim That man can talk on the phone, drink coffee, and build a set of custom cabinets all at the same time. <laughs> I mean, he's got it, you know. I, I know he's retired and he'll go off, slow down. He's still, it's still in there. Okay. Now, let me say about the finishes here. We must admit that those that are in the finished trades are a little bit more like artists. It's not just if it touches, nail it. It's got to look good. It's got to present well. It's got to look complete. They're more particular. Now, I remember talking, coming into a house. We were go our company was going to paint the inside of this house. And I was talking to the uh, sheet rocker. Now, there's a difference between a, a sh drywall hanger and a drywall finisher. A drywall hanger, that gap will be covered. Don't worry about it. I've seen them push and push and push, and all of a sudden a hole come up where they didn't take time to cut around an electrical plug. They just pushed it through, and now there's a damaged corner, and I'm thinking, that board's bad. He said, no, the mud man will fix it. <laughs> They'll cover all the cracks. And, and I think that's what First Peter's talking about when it says, for love covers a multitude of sins. The mud man will cover it. Don't worry about it. The finish will come in there and complete it. I want you to get this. No matter the brokenness, no matter how much it may come up short, no matter how, oops. Who's ever heard an oops? You never want to hear your surgeon say oops. <laughs> Drywall hangers show up leaving. They can't get out of there fast enough. But drywall finishers, they're meticulous and they're particular. And, and you watch them and they've got these drills with these paddle bits. And a good mud man, he won't take the mud out of the bucket. He'll add some water and he'll take that drill and he'll get it whipped up thoroughly and evenly and get the consistency where it spreads evenly. And he's meticulous about his tools because he's taking that mud knife and he's going to create a perfect finished in, but if it has the least little piece of trash on it, all of a sudden it'll have a line, a mar spot in it. And so they're constantly washing their tools and washing their hands and getting the trash out of them. They want to do a beautiful finished product. I'm, I'm going somewhere, stay with just for another minute. It takes that finishing 
to make a house able to become a home. Now, I want you to get this. It takes all of these people to create a place where it's warm, safe, and beautiful that provides light and water. But let me ask a question. Whose name is on the house? It's none of the tradespeople. It's the builder who's got the loan, who bought the land, and who's got the blueprint. He may never physically touch a thing, but he's got the vision for the finished product. If something goes wrong on that job, it comes back on him. If there's a lien on that property, it affects him. His name goes on the sign in the yard. I'm going to say this. God is the master builder. He has the vision for the blueprint. He's done purchased it all and he's already provided it all. But he is looking for finishers to... I'm afraid the building goes up fast and we think we're almost there. But when you're born again, the work of God has just begun in your life. There's a finishing. There's a process. There's a renewal. There's a refining that is required. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach you. Here's what I want you to get. It's his house, but he's looking for finishers. You ever thought about it in the Old Testament that God ordained that when the children of Israel pulled up stakes and they moved from one camping spot to another, it was always the tribe of Judah that led the way. Now, I could say, well, why not the oldest brother? The Bible's prophesied that the oldest brother, he was as unstable as water. So you can't follow a weak need, lily livered, lick spittle lead by putting their finger. You need somebody who's committed, who's not afraid to put it out there and move. And then I thought, why not the tribe of Levi? That was a preach line. But God said, I want you to follow Judah. And Judah means praise. And the face of what people saw the children of God when they came in the promised land, it was the tribe of Judah. It was praise. You know what will break down every barrier, what will remove every obstacle that will lead us into a place of promise is when God's people begin to praise and worship. You can can look it up. The last thing that separated the holy from the most holy place was an altar of incense which was a place of praise that the, the cloud of incense went up as praises before I feel the Holy Ghost. We need to know that what leads the way is praise. Praise is awesome. But we never think about who the third tribe or the fourth tribe or the sixth tribe is or the last tribe the last tribe is the one who ministers to the weak, the feeble, the stragglers. Can I tell you, that was the tribe of Dan that come alongside those and spoke words of encouragement. You can make it. Let me help you pick up your load. I'm not going to leave you behind. Can I say as a pastor, I'm thankful for the praise team that's the face of a worship service. I'm thankful as pastor that my face is maybe what you see come across this pulpit. Bless your hearts, this face. Hallelujah. This face. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is, but I'm thankful today, just as the king had potters that nobody knew their name. It lists all these genealogies, but God thought enough of those among the hedges, the landscapers and the potters that were in the king's house for what cause they participated in his work. Can I tell you, it's more than a praise team. It's more than the pastor. If you see a turtle sitting on a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. And if you see a pastor leading a congregation of people, he didn't do it alone. There are potters. There are finishers in the house. There is the spirit of the tribe of Dan that says, I didn't see brother so-and-so this week. I'm going to call him and encourage him. I didn't see this family. I'm going to send them a card. I'm going to go... We need the tribe of Dan for the king's work to go forward. We need encouragers Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Can I say this today? Some of you could never see yourself teaching a class, preaching a message, or playing an instrument. But this pastor is thankful for those who are potters, who help in the finished product. That are those who give faithfully week after week after week. Those who attend faithfully week after week. We could never do this if you didn't do that. God is saying through his word, I don't forget the people. You may not know their name, and you may not see them, and you don't... 
feel comfortable being up front, but I'm telling you, this pastor wants to say thank you that there are still finishers, there's still potters, there's still givers, there's still worshipers, there's still encouragers in the house of the Lord. I don't know if you understand this or not. Hidden among the plants. Do you know that these people, these potters, these that worked, we don't know their name, but we do know this. They never sat at the king's table and they never sat in the, in the king's parlor and discussed politics with him, but they worked and they did what they could. I'm thankful for those of you who may be hidden among the stuff, who clean the church, who pray, who endure, who contend, who intercede, and on and on. You may never be up front. You may never be seen. But here today, God wants you to know that he knows your name. He's keeping a record. You will not give a cup of cold water to a prophet and him forget it. You will not give a tithe. You will not give an offering. You will not give a praise. You will not give a prayer that God does not remember it. And let me say this pastor is so thankful for those who participate in this ministry to help the king of kings and the lord of lords achieve his goal so why potters in the king's house first of all potters are finishers of vessels vessels of this time were clay now we got tupperware today we even got disposable tupperware being sold today anybody ever had leftovers out of a cool whip container or a little margarine tub. Anybody ever had lima beans warmed up? Come on, somebody. Amen. They didn't have plastics and they didn't have mason jars. They used crockery or they used pottery. And so the potter, in order to have vessels to be used in the service of the king's ministry, those that he may be lobbying a as an ambassador or those who's trying to sign treaties with or people he's trying to help or armies he's trying to amass or resources he's trying to gain or even to gain the mind of God. It took, it took people to help work in that overall ministry. For, for a potter to be successful, he's got to get his hands dirty. Right. Not everybody wants to get their hands dirty. I'm so thankful we serve a God that's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Because he spit on the ground and got his hands dirty. He shaped humanity. And when God robed himself in flesh and dwelt among us, there was a man that could not see. I'm so glad Jesus wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He wasn't afraid of lepers. He wasn't afraid of prostitutes. He wasn't afraid of the broken. I'm so glad that Jesus spit on the ground. He said, you don't got no eyes at work. Let me just make you some new eyes. And he put it on him and said, go and wash. What I'm trying to tell you today is that we've got to be like the king we serve, not afraid to get our hands dirty. You got to get your hands involved in what's going on. Did you know that just like painting or or drywall or carpentry, it's not it's not just a visual. There's a feel. Skill tradesmen can know by how the hammer sounds whether it found an anchoring place. A, a painter knows by the, by the sound or the feel if, if the, the sprayer is about to give up the ghost. And, and the drywall guy, he just knows. He don't even have to open his eyes. He, he can just know by the swap of the knife if, if it's going to be right or not. There's a whole industry, if you didn't know this, of blind sculptors. They're very similar to to potters that they can do the work of a sculptor or a potter by feel, by touch. And, and, and I want you to know that a sculptor has three aspects. He has the clay, but then he has to add some water to make it pliable or workable. And then he spins it around and around. What are these three components? The clay is the, is the earth, the natural Resource The water, Sadler's opinion, is the word of God. We deal with hard-hearted people. We see people that are rigid and inflexible. But the word of God will soften a hard heart. The word of God will give hope. The word of God will say, take me, use me, mold me, sculpt me, shape me. 
So what is the spinning around? I believe that's time as the earth goes round and round. Can I tell you what? You're never going to complete a vessel in one second, one minute, one hour, but it's the daily touches. You see somebody today, you don't say I'm one and done. You reach tomorrow and touch them in the next day. and You keep touching their lives. You keep influencing them. You keep exhorting the righteousness and good works until there's a completed work spinning time. Vessels to contain water. The king needed fresh water. Vessels to contain fuel that could be used for lights had to be stored. Food and food storage was required. The king, to be effective, needed some people, some potters to do some finishing for his house. You may never be seen, but you're so important. Who are the potters and the finishers? I'll just tell you. I put this on top of my list. Soul winners. Soul winners. You didn't even know you were lost. But somebody says, where are you? And you can't answer that question. Somebody can point you in the right direction. I'm so thankful today for someone like Sister Tomasa Neely, who saw a stack of invites for Easter up on this desk in front of the pulpit. And she said, Pastor, if you're not going to use for those, I'm going to take them and I'm going to pass them out. And I said, sui. Won't have to ask me twice. She came by here. She didn't want to be greedy and take them off, so she took about half of them. And when she had a chance, she went over here to the soccer park. And if you were dumb enough to make eye contact with that apostolic prayer warrior, she was on you like white on rice. She said, Whoa, come on. You need to come to church. You need to come to church. You need to come to church. She landed on them. They were bowling out of the park like crazy. She did so good, she went back and got the rest. She said, if nobody else are going to use these, I'm going to use it. Do you know where I think that comes from? I knew Tomas before she knew Jesus. I saw the unresolved conflict and the, the angers and the unanswered questions. And, and how did I get here and how am I going to get out of here? But God, who is rich in mercy, who is faithful. I saw a transformation in my sister from everything's wrong and there is no God to everything's good because I see God. It was, a, and I, I just know where her passion for souls comes from. It's not because she's got it all figured out or she's better than anybody else. It's because she knows what it is to be on bottom. And the God we serve can take you from the bottom and set you on top. Our God can take you from under the dog pile and set you in heavenly places above it all. And she says, God is no respecter person. If he'll do it for me, he will do it for you also. It's the joy of the Lord is her strength. It just flows out of her. She's a finisher. Altar workers. I do get perplexed. Do you know that this is exhausting work? I mean, I guess I could preach it. Let us turn to the 23rd Psalm. Would you really want a pastor preaching about eternal things in a passive way? Or you want somebody who really believes with passion what they're talking about? And if you're doing this right and you're doing it regular, it, you're going to be tired. It's, it's a draining job. And sometimes we get to an altar service where people are in the valley of indecision or uncertainty or not know what to do next. I'm thankful that there's some altar workers that come prayed up. They don't have to find a quiet corner to have the pump primed. They show up ready. They're like spiritual midwives saying they're holy. Holy Ghost wants to be born in you and through you and they battle with you to see new life brought down from above and people become new creatures in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for finishers like youth workers who don't give up on kids. Mama and the church are never going to give up on kids. I know we're living in unprecedented times. I know we're dealing with things we never thought we'd have to deal with. Obvious things are not so obvious to everybody, but we can't quit pouring into them. We can't keep complaining about them. We can't see what's broken. We got to remind them that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not going to call out to the stupid things. I'm going to call out to the king that's in them. God has called you for such a time as this. He wants to use you 
to reach the broken. He, you are here for a reason. You may not have any control who your mom and dad were or even if they're still together. And some may think you're an accident or you're a flaw or you're a mistake or you're a mess up. But God said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I've got a purpose for you. In your weakness, then you are made strong. I'm able to use your lowest places, your greatest messes to bring back the greatest recovery for others. It starts fast, but finishing is slow sometimes. Why do I say that? Because you're going to invest in teenagers and they're still going to mess up. But do we write them off? Who's glad that they didn't write you off? But a good finisher knows how to repair what is broken. I'm thankful for worship leaders and musicians. I'm thankful for, I mean, there's so many talented people in our area because of Nashville's music industry. You know how to get the drummer off your porch? Pay him for the pizza. Don't bring up music at a restaurant to your server because they're probably going to tell you that, oh, you didn't see me on the Opry Friday night. I'm going to be on the Opry Saturday night. You didn't see my record. You need to go to Spotify and catch my demo out. They're everywhere around here. It's not enough to be talented. God's people need to be anointed. But can I also say that singers, worship leaders, and musicians need to also be instructors that God poured giftings and talents and somebody invested in you. And guess what? You have a responsibility. If the Lord tarries his coming, there's going to be a need for more drummers, more bass players, more guitar players, more piano players, more tambourine players, more praise singers. And that was the weakest amen I've ever heard. You may not know it, but I just enlisted my third drumming student. I don't consider myself a good drummer, but we got, I mean, they are some monster drummers. I can, they're not there yet, but I see it. I, they're, it's coming. It, it, it's coming. Man, I, I, got, I got one of them that showed no interest. I think he was here because his mama made him come and, and he came and I kept, every week I asked him, did you practice? No. Did you practice? No. Did you practice? No. I don't know what happened a couple of weeks ago, but I said, okay, here comes my no student. Remember me talking about there's just some things you have to endure? Uh, here we go. 30 minutes of torture. Hallelujah. Brother Shane, the light bulb had gone off. I don't know if he had been on, on uh, uh, home arrest. I, I, I don't know if his parents were punishing him. But he showed up and he played this first song I laid out before him. He went through the whole four and a half minute song and did not make one mistake. And I went, who's in that drum booth? I literally opened the door to make sure he hadn't slipped in a drummer on me. I said, did you know you went through that whole song and didn't make it? Yeah. I said, what changed? He said, oh, I practiced this way. I said, do you see what some practice can do for you and for me? <laughs> My Bible says to exhort one another to righteousness and good works. All right. What am I trying to tell you? I could have given up in a couple of weeks, but you know what I said? As long as he's willing to come, I'm, I'm willing to pour into him. I'm going to put the water in. I'm going to encourage you can make it. You may be behind the other students. You may be straggling. You may not come. Hey, he had no musical talent in his family. Nobody plays an instrument, but he's the first of many from the generation to generation. I know I'm, I know I'm talking about music, but I, I can say the same thing for preachers and teachers. I, I, there are some of you that God's got a calling. There's an anointing in your life and you need to quit being passive and you need to apply yourself. You need to study. You need to dig. You need to learn because God needs some finishers in his house. This wasn't in my nine o'clock, but I'll tell you Friday night I came over here. A young man Drove five and a half hours to meet me at this church because about three weeks ago, 
far from God, he had a visitation of the Holy Ghost. And he, he called me on the phone and said, you're the only person I know that baptizes in Jesus' name. He said, if I drove and come in on a Friday night, would you baptize me? I said, you come, we'll talk, and then I'll baptize. Brother Alford, I've baptized people that I didn't have as much confidence in their experience as they did. But this young man didn't come and try to beat against the air and teach me anything. He came with a spirit of humility and brokenness and tears began to flow down his cheeks. He just said, I know that I cried out to God who I used to not believe existed. And then I realized I was mad at him because of who my parents were or were not. But then when I found myself in a low place and he heard me. I began to pray and God began to speak. And the more I began to talk to him, the more he began to talk to me. And the boy is sitting in this sanctuary with tears running in his cheek Friday night. And he said, all I know is I had to take off from work. And I had a compulsion to drive five and a half hours because I got to be baptized. What, what, what are you saying? You know how many services and sermons I poured into that boy and it's bouncing off him like dead firewood. But I'm telling you what, don't give up. Keep watering. Keep preaching. The word of God will never return void. I'm telling you, I done the boy, when he got out of my zip code, I said, Lord, I'm relieved. It's somebody else's problem. But I'm telling you what, God's word is faithful and he'll draw them. If you'll do your part, God will do his part. I baptize him in Jesus' name. His countenance changed. His attitude changed. He floated out of this place. What am I saying? I'm saying my God is looking for some finishers. Some people that won't give up on other people. That will keep instructing and teaching people. Exhorting them to righteousness and good works. I believe teachers are finishers. I told this story earlier. Y'all just forgive me. I had a teacher in school. I went to a private Christian school. That teacher attended the school that sponsored the Christian school. He, pa- he went to the church that pastored. Oh, it's over. He attended the church that sponsored the Christian school. That congregation was about 500 people that all looked the same. If they were a brand of ice cream, it'd be vanilla. And he was from the north. And He heard my y'all, and I reckon so. And I think he sensed a tinge of racism in me. And he kind of made it his mission. He was going to squeeze that out of me. I, I felt judged. I'm just being honest with you. And so that went on for a year or two. And I was participating in after school sports. I was playing soccer for the school. And my Sunday school teacher, Brother Kevin... He came to see me play. And this six foot six, 310 pound African American man, dressed in a three piece suit and a tie, came walking onto the edge of the soccer field. He's clapping. He's like, Who is this guy? Who is this guy? I don't know this guy. Who is this guy? And when the game was over and we ran, I, one, I ran over and gave him a big hug, and he gave me a big hug, and he patted me on the back. And that teacher, who sensed a degree of racism in me. Who is this? I said, that's my Sunday school teacher. (laughs) That's Jerry Ford. I wanted to give him his resume. His resume was this. He graduated college with honors, became a CPA. Then he went back to college and got a degree in criminal justice and became an Alabama straight trooper. And then he went back to school and became a a mortician and opened up a chain of mortuaries. He, everything he touched, he succeeded at. He was, he was just a beautiful example of those who try succeed. Now, why, why, why are you bringing this up, Pastor? I'm bringing it up because it was Jerry Ford, who was my Sunday school teacher when I was a mess up, distracted hormone ridden teenage boy full of energy and every time I would walk in that class he didn't start going you're going to sit down and be quiet no there comes my little professor 
What are you preaching? I'm trying to tell you. He didn't see the problem in me. He saw the promise that was in me. We need some teachers that don't see everything as a problem, but they see the promises of God. You're right for this generation. God has called you and equipped you, little professor. I want to tell that teacher, you ought to come to my church. Where every Sunday's multicultural Sunday. Man, it's quiet in here. I got to hurry. I'm speaking to moms and dads today. God ordained the family before he empowered the church. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. That train up means be a finisher. Bring them to a fruitful end. Bring them to a successful conclusion. Don't let them grow up wild. Stake them up. Tie them up. Hey, I tied tomatoes up so that fruit didn't drag the ground. Come on, somebody. I got some teenagers I'd like to tie up too. Parents, quit trying to be your child's friend. The hard part wasn't giving birth to them. That's just where it began. You need to start asking some questions. Now, who is it you're going out with? What's on your phone? You ain't got nothing to hide, do you? You're not leaving this house wearing that. We need some parents to put their hands to the lives of their children, to shape them. Don't let them grow up like everybody else is growing up. Everybody else is broke, Amen. confused, Amen. faithless, right. corrupt. Right. We're not raising dogs in our house. We're raising sons and daughters of the king. Right. Don't ask, do you want to go to prayer chain? What time did you sign up for prayer chain, son? We're not going to just forgive when we feel like it. We're going to be givers and forgivers. Help them finish. Help them be complete. Don't let it. Well, I was born this way. You need to be born again. Let me put my. Parents say to your kids, you were created for such a time as this. Mold them to be teachers in this world to be tithers, to be worshipers, to be givers, to lead businesses, to be successful, not for their glory, but for God's glory. Be a potter, pour into others, mold and shape them. Be a finisher of other vessels. Without potters in the king's house, there would be no party in the king's house. And if you don't realize your significance. You may never be the face. You may never lead from this position, but you have an impact on the king reaching his goal, which is a finished house with finished vessels for the work that is before us. Can I tell you this? I've preached a lot. I've preached a lot. I love to preach. It's what God called me to do. But I've reached that age where I get just as excited about somebody else preaching as I do me preaching. Especially somebody that I feel like I've had an impact or an influence or a connection with. There's a a preacher over in South Central Missouri named Gary Spencer that I felt like I had just a little impact in his life. And to hear the exploits of what he and his church are doing now, I get excited about that. When I see somebody that I've spent some time with to see them to to reconnect and grow and mature like Gil or to see someone like Matt who didn't grow up in church or definitely not Pentecostal apostolic church and and to see him grow and and want to impart words and be used. I'm telling you, it's all I can do to sit still. They're up here doing a great job. I'm over going... Won't be long, I'll get to sit down there with y'all and people like them be leading. You know, I'm, I'm going to be their biggest cheerleader, their biggest fan. I get excited. Excited when other people do well. God is looking for potters, finishers. Now, catch this. This is, a, this is a very important statement. I'm getting ready to wind it down. Who knows that 
Jesus is the one who does the calling. If your mama called and daddy sent, you won't stay with it. But when you encounter Jesus on the Damascus Road, it'll, it'll leave an impact on you. Jesus calls. Who knows Jesus does the saving? Jesus does the redeeming. Jesus does the atoning. Jesus empowers us. But guess what? Then Jesus says, but you make disciples of all men. You know what he's really saying? I got it started. Now what I want you to finish them. We think being Holy Ghost filled, we've concluded. That's just the beginning. If you thought just having the baby was it, you ain't got through the terrible twos. You haven't lived through teenage years. You haven't lost sleep wondering if they're dead in the ditch because they're too dumb to call you to let you know they're running. Oh, I'm sorry, I slipped into parent mode here. When you live through all that and much, 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 much more, what are you saying, Pastor? I, I, I'm saying very clearly, what an awesome thought to realize that God did all the heavy lifting, but then he's entrusting us to finish what was started. What do you mean by finishing? We look at a new convert and say, oh, baby, you're doing so good. But let's not use that word. And here's why. Oh, I'm so glad to see you today and how much progress you've made, but... I don't think I would go there or do that, and here's why. We got to be kind. We got to be gentle. We got to be meek, but we got to keep finishing. There is brokenness. There are flaws. There are spaces, voids in people's lives that the mercy of God can cover, but we've got to finish it, finish it. God did not save you, and he will not save them to stay in the pig pen. He has called us out of darkness. Yeah. Hear me. Can you imagine a man coming by that pig pen saying, aren't you so-and-so's son? Yeah. He's covered in mud. He's been rolling in pig's, pig droppings. He's been eating the husk. He, he's got corn silk coming out between his teeth. Y'all getting what I'm saying? He's got bed head, rags for clothes, no shoes. He knows he stinks. He knows he's dirty. He knows he's eating things he ought not be eating and hanging out in places he ought not be hanging out. But he also knows he made a decision and he has no hope. But I'm glad a man come down the road and said, hey, aren't you so-and-so? Yeah, got his head down full of shame. He said, you know, I walked by your old family home place and I saw your daddy. He wasn't on the porch. He was down walking at the end of the driveway. And he was looking up one way and down the other. And I think he was just looking for you to come home. Now, he doesn't say that in the Bible, but I'm going to tell you this. Sadler's opinion here. I believe when we have a revelation that God hadn't written us off. I'm not a dope dealer. I'm a hope dealer. I'm here today to tell you, God is not looking to write you out. He's looking to write you in. He wants to do a completed work in your life. You may have messed up. You may have gotten off the, the potter's wheel. You may be flawed and broken but my God is able to make you new and fresh the Bible says that when the father saw him he came and fell on his neck and he reclothed him God is looking for you and I to direct people back to the Father's house. I don't know if you know this or not, but we need to constantly have this word on our lips. And what he did for me, he'll do for you. He's just looking for you to draw nigh. For if you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. If you go looking for him, he'll come looking for you. If you cry out to him, he'll come back towards you. We need, we need, we need to be finishers. But here's what I'm afraid of as Sister Beth comes to the piano. I'm afraid of like building the house. In a short time, we see a lot of progress externally, but there's still a lot of things unfinished inside. Great progress that everybody sees, but God wants to do a complete work. He wants to see the house finished. Finished. We celebrate you potters, you finishers in the house of the Lord today. But just as sure as the Lord is here, I know the devil is here too. He'll do everything he can to cause you to doubt, to nullify, cause you to feel disqualified. 
you'll start saying to yourself, I've made mistakes. Anybody made mistakes here? Anybody got issues here? Don't feel very much like you're worth a whole lot. Anybody got that one? Don't feel very... Who'd, who'd, want, who'd want to deal with me? Talk to me. Who could I help? Let me ask a question. Anybody ever gone to the doctor? Who's ever gone to the doctor and taken his advice? Because I know some of y'all don't. You go to the doctor, but he tells you what you don't want to hear. You don't take his advice. You just find you another doctor. That's still good preaching. Do you think you've ever gone to a doctor that you trusted and took their advice that in their life they have issues? So you're saying they can affect you positively even though they've got issues? Who, who's ever voted in here? This, I'm, not, I'm not being, who's ever voted? So you had enough confidence in that person to vote for them. I'm afraid too many people say, oh, I don't know anything bad about them, so I'm going to vote about them. Vote for them. That's not a good free record. If you don't know, don't vote for them. You don't know what you're getting. Who thinks you've ever voted for some government official that's made a mistake? But you voted for them anyway. You've given them voice and power over some aspect of your life. School board, mayor, governor, whatever. Do you realize that even pastors many times don't feel like they have a whole lot to offer? Talk about me. Why would you come listen to me? Why would you come here? What could I say? What can I do? I'm here today to tell you. Doesn't matter if you have issues. Doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. Doesn't matter how you feel about yourself. God has called you to finish his work. Do you know his name is on it? His name's on the church. He owns the house. Amen. To him be all praise, honor, and glory. But think about it. How humbling is the revelation that he laid the foundation, paid the price, provided the tools and resources, but he's waiting on you to finish it. Today, who wants to thank the King of Kings for that opportunity? Ooh. I want you to say, man, I, I cut out a whole other sermon on the end. I cut it out. Don't you feel blessed today? I cut that out. I think you got the point. Who in here thinks God could use you to have an impact on somebody else? A finisher. I'm looking at some of these young people today, man. My heart is full. Some of us are not going back to school at this point, right? So some of us are probably at this point not going to be governor. Who's come to that point? You're probably not going to be governor. Probably not going to be a doctor. But you can be something so much better. You can be a potter, a finisher in the king's house. Do you know how many things I imagine those people got to see just because they were servants? In the king's house? Yeah. Treaty signed, armies built, resources provided, liberty brought to the house of Israel, all because they, they had a small part in it. I, I don't know, guys, that's worth more than rubies and gold and silver. To see a life changed, to go from the lost column to the saved column, to see somebody endure to the end, finish, finish. I'm asking you today, if you feel like God wants you to be a finisher, if you think you got something to offer, if you desire to hear God's voice today to say, how would you use me, Lord? Maybe it's even baser than that. Maybe you're just asking, God, can you use me? Sister Beth's going to sing this chorus. How would that you would slip out of your row and faith believe and walk down front, throw your hands in the air and begin to worship God, singing praises unto him. If you want God to use you, to bless you, to... Be, be an example to your family to see your kids and grandkids saved.
sing it again. 